First of all, how's your team been? <laughs> and where are you exactly based out of? Good. I'm based out of New York. I live about an hour north of the city. And this week has been good. We have some different collaborations in the pipeline. And so I've been really focused on that, even like some merchandise type stuff we just made. There are bracelets that are going to be hitting That's the internet awesome. soon. <laughs> so yeah, busy but fun week. Um, those are always the fun details to deal with. Yeah, that is so exciting for Dutch to be releasing their merchandise. I have been like going over your guys' like newsletters and stuff that you're sending and even your website and stuff. I love how you guys act as a smart cultural critic and I'm very, very excited to know. First, I'd like to give a quick intro about you, you know, to your audience who might yeah. not know. Is um, Daisy is the CEO and co-founder of Dirt Media DAO which is a blockchain-based publisher, which is turning readers into subscribers and subscribers into investors. And they recently even did a seed round of $1.2 million, um, led by Collab and Currency, alongside Unicorn DAO and many others. Daisy, so much thank you for doing this and extremely excited to get to know you and get to know your story. I think one of the first questions I wanted to ask you is, you've been all your life in media. How did you get involved in the crypto space? Yeah, that's such a good question. Um, I think that we sort of not stumbled into it, but my co-founder and I have always been interested in what's cutting edge on the internet. Um, and for so many of the tectonic shifts in digital life, like being on social media, it's the type of thing that um, you kind of have to participate to understand it. And NFTs are similar in that if you want to write about them, you really need to be sort of playing in that sandbox. And so for us to have a, a newsletter about digital culture, it felt like almost like a meta commentary for us to use NFTs as a crowdfunding mechanism. And then as we started to experiment with that and see what was being built in the Web3 space, we really felt like there was an opportunity to build a Web3 media Media company that wasn't just using Web3 tools to cover Web3 media, but was using the tools, but creating media around really anything. Uh, and this, so that's where we've sort of plugged ourselves in specifically around how can the blockchain sort of change the relationship between a subscriber and a publication and create not only more of a two-way street, but more value for both parties and that's how we sort of got started down this road that's amazing and when did you first discover about nfts did you end up being a collector like how did talk about that journey so i think that my co-founder's first nft was a blip map rose um my first nft was one of our dirt editions which we launched with mirror in i believe may or june 2021 um but as you know like six months in yeah. crypto space is like multiple years so it seems like a really <laughs> long time ago but yeah. my first nft was actually a dirt nft so it's a special one to me <laughs> that's amazing and did you guys first start with nfts or did you first try and build a community on discord on twitter like how did you go about that initial first steps well our community was really just the email newsletter list up until that point i think we launched the discord around the same time we started selling the nfts so now, you know, we're working on building our own platform, but right now you could say our community is sort of distributed across a few different audiences. There's the newsletter, Discord, the NFT holders, the token holders, and there's a lot of people, there's a couple hundred people sort of sitting in the middle of that Venn diagram, but there's others, there's certain other people that really only want to engage in one of those pools. And so a big part of thinking about how are we going to structure dirt was how do you serve the people that only want to engage on a free subscriber level? Mm -hmm. And then how do you serve the people who are the most loyal um, consumers of your brand that want to be essentially micro investors? And so the, all of the way that dirt is being structured is to strike that balance that's amazing and you mentioned you have about 160 wallets you know involved in your DAO. yeah and each of them are you know subscribers worth 500 dollars, which is unheard of in the consumer media like subscription space how were mm -hmm. you able to establish that customer base people who were willing to pay for you know culture critic and news and updates about the culture yeah so i think we sold around ninety thousand dollars worth of nfts in the crowdfunding space that was over multiple job drops and then there's around 200 wallets in the ecosystem so yeah it shakes out to as if each person had given us 500 dollars. some people gave a lot more than that some people gave less i think moving away from this humorphic idea that a subscription is something that you give 
once a year in order to access content and then it sort of just like goes away at the end of the year and you renew it to an idea that like a media company could offer like operate more like a streetwear company where Mm. yes maybe you purchase a subscription but you can also um become a super collector or super fan by picking up other collaborations or limited edition drops throughout the year which really hasn't been explored as much up until this point And the thing about the blockchain is that, yes, this would be technically possible without it, but the overhead for bringing a digital product to market is so much lower than trying to have a tote bag or a hat for your publication, because while those things are very cool and we're certainly going to have physical merchandise, you have to have somebody's home address, you have to have their email, you have to have their credit card. If you want to surprise and delight somebody with an airdrop, that's a subscriber to your publication, all that you need is their wallet address. So there really is like a re-architecting of this relationship where rather than the fundamental unit of consumer data being an email address or a home address, it's a wallet. For us, I would argue we're sort of sitting in 2.5 where having a wallet and having an email address are, I think, equally important and have have been equal parts of our business model. Um, I also recognize that like, the ability to keep those two things separate or have people that only want to be an email address or only want to be a wallet address is really important for people's data at this time, especially people that have been very burned by um, the lack of personal data in the last digital media boom and the sort of um, manipulations of the algorithm, which actually really came to a head this week uh, with a lot of criticism towards Instagram. So yeah, I think um, I'm like going so far away from your original question. But, no, it um, makes sense and it adds up, you know, it's not yeah. easy. So I appreciate that. Like, I appreciate you going in detail. Yeah, well, basically like it's a long way of saying um, people will spend more money than they would on a one-time subscription because they just, they perceive it differently. Um, they perceive it as having more value. Um, they feel like they're getting more out of it. And, you know, media, like, it's it's a really good opportunity for media to have this because so many of the old business models, like digital advertising and subscriber revenue are going away. And do you... Or they're going away in the previous form. Right. And even though it's it sounds amazing for the consumer, right? And, you know, like to make a one main, a one one-time payment but you know for you as an admin and for you who's running a business is it complicated for you in terms of logistics in terms of thinking about oh my god you know are we going to run out of money if we're only going to have a customer base that's just paying once versus someone having paying small amounts but consistently over over the course of a year yeah totally i think it's like again going back to this idea that people are going to want to engage on different levels and how will each of those levels be monetized so mm-hmm. In the future, somebody who has just a free email subscription, that tier can be monetized through um, sponsored content and advertising and referrals sold into that newsletter. If you're holding an NFT subscription, that would basically let you um, access paywalled content. Um, And then the DAO tier is like a founder pass or a token holder, which is, you know, more expensive, will generate more secondary market revenue because there'll only be a limited amount of them. Um, And so that tier is sort of investing in like a different way. But with each sort of level of engagement with the publication, there is its own sort of business model and like product market or product audience fit around, okay, what makes this consumer valuable to us? What makes us valuable to them? What are they hoping to get out of this relationship? That is super smart. I love how you talk about monetizing in such different manners, you know, um, your content and your media. It's amazing. And it's very, very empowering for the people, you know. I feel like there's so many amazing content writers. Even if it's on an individual level or if it's an agency, they might be really talented, but if they don't know how to monetize it, it's very, very difficult for them to sustain themselves and that quality. And, you know, we as consumers end up missing out on a lot. So I think that's incredible. And I'd like to love, um, I'd love to ask you, why do you think there isn't such interest and such hype around DAOs as compared to NFTs and crypto? Um, I think, well, I think that DAOs are still sort of finding a balance between the spectrum of extreme centralization and decentralization. I think every DAO is going to fall at a different point on that spectrum. Um, But maybe, you know, an NFT is something that you purchase. I think the average person can understand the financial speculation motivation, even if they're not incentivized to have it. But that NFT relationship, I think, is almost like without the structure of a DAO or community is like a one-off consumer relationship, right? You Mm -hmm. made this one-time purchase, you now own this thing. 
with a DAO, it's an ongoing relationship. You're really plugging yourself into a structure. And I think it requires more, I don't want to say sophistication on the participants part because it's really putting it on them. I think it's really on the DAO to master the messaging around what it means to plug yourself into that ecosystem of the DAO, Mm -hmm. what your participation means and the value of your participation to yourself, the value of your participation to the overall brand or brand equity around the DAO. And so for us, we think of our DAO as an editorial board, a group of people who are sort of super fans and micro investors in dirt, making curated decisions around story ideas. Mm. Everyone knows what an editorial board is, right? So this is like very easy to understand. Everyone understands, okay, this is a group of people investing together. This is a group of people voting on which NFTs to collect. But there's a whole, like there's a a wide uh, world of utility that DAOs could engage in that like they just I think aren't because the messaging around that structure isn't there it's still at the level of like a thought experiment right and like dirt is really an attempt to take the thought experiment of what a media DAO could be and like put it into play um but I don't think I I feel uncomfortable shifting it onto the level of sophistication of the consumer because I think it's really up to a DAO to say like yes this might have a few more steps than an NFT, um, but like long term, this is like signing up for a social network, or this is like signing up for, you know, an editorial board or a union or a cooperative, and really help people to understand what that relationship is going to mean to them. Whereas like the NFT relationship can be as superficial as like something you buy once. I love that answer, and it's so interesting to see. I feel like we, I wasn't aware of a lot of media DAOs. And I'm extremely Mm -hmm. curious to know how is it that you guys exactly operate, right? I feel like you as a media DAO, you have so many contributors coming from like various fields, whether they're writers, whether they're graphic people, whoever it might be. And say, for example, Bankless DAO, right? Like to get one task done, they have to follow so many steps to get people on Mm -hmm. Discord, then go to Discord for discussion or go to Snapshot for like proposal voting, then take Mm -hmm. a project management tool and then, you know... um, I think it's called Gnosis for treasury and stuff. Mm-hmm. How is it that you guys operate internally? Yeah, I mean, some of the steps are similar. Um, we've we've realized though that like email is still like a very useful tool to communicate in this space. So we do actually have an internal DAO newsletter that people, you know, we have people onboard themselves into from Discord. So we've started like announcing our votes in that newsletter just to have more mm-hmm. visibility for people that don't spend all day on Discord. Um, But yeah, we do still use Snapshot as our voting mechanism. And, you know, I don't see us moving away from that in the short term. So the idea of like a future platform that consolidates some of these steps is like definitely very appealing and something that we're invested in working on. Um, But right now it is a little bit of like a triangle between like Discord, your inbox and Snapshot and try to keep it like pretty tight, but haven't been able to consolidate it tighter than that. I know that there are some DAOs and for certain votes, you can do like an up down vote in discord. Um, and we've done that before, but, um, then you're kind of missing the people that are off discord. So yeah, yeah, it's definitely a challenge. Messaging is a challenge. I know there are people who are working on wallet to wallet messaging. Um, but I think that email is going to continue to be important to be honest, especially for us, because we're a newsletter model so people are reading the newsletter in their inbox and we can kind of make the fair assumption that they're engaging with announcements from us there as well and as an admin what would you say are some of your pain points that you're facing in that entire process from having people on board to having them in being informed to having them contribute operations that side yeah i think it's just the fundamental scarcity of people's attention to be honest like you really need to be bringing a lot to somebody's lifestyle and their sense of their own identity for them to want to engage with you every day. Mm -hmm. And that's the value that we're able to create through our content. I think if that value wasn't there, if like the attention wasn't already on the content, the desire to talk about it and talk about it with other people in Discord or recommend other cultural products to one another, it would be a lot more difficult, I think, to engage people's attention long term. The substance and the the really great writing in Dirt is like sort of a baseline that everyone can engage around. So even though people might come in and out of participating in each vote, as long as they're staying in that subscriber relationship, as long as they consider themselves readers of Dirt, we still have their attention and their time. Mm-hmm. 
Um, and so I think the pain point is how do you take that reader and move them to the next level of participation consistently? Right. Um, but the great thing about having a subscription product that's separate from the token or the NFT is that like people are in that readership. Yeah. They've already established that relationship and that is a relationship that is part of their identity. Um, and so the, the idea of being a DAO member, that I, their affinity for that might not be as deep as being a reader of the content, right. but we know because they're a reader of the content that we can be working on that relationship consistently and that that relationship could deepen at any time. And do you feel like you struggle with educating people what are DAOs in the first place to have them even come in and contribute and participate in your DAO? Like... How is it that you work on that? Yeah, definitely. It's something that like, it can come across as overly complicated. I think, you know, sort of like I was talking about before, like people might understand it better if it's framed as an editorial board. I also use like a lot of analogies. I talk about publications that already exist, like the New York Times, with really sort of passionate communities around certain sections, like, for example, the recipe section. Um, that community is so passionate that you can actually have like a separate cooking only subscription to the New York Times so you can like save your recipes. And if you read the comments on the recipes, people are writing like really substantial stories or additions or modifications. But even as passionate as that community is, it's not a two way street, right? Like mm. they're not able to actually develop those recipes or vote on what they want to see or cuisines they want to see highlighted. So if the New York Times is going to go one step further and say, okay, all of you cooking subscribers, you have this separate um, subscription because you love the cooking section so much. Like we're going to give you this pass that basically enables you to make decisions around what you see in this section that would be a huge step forward into re-architecting this relationship between the new york times and the new york times subscriber to be more of a two-way street where you actually have a mechanism to talk back to the times to create value for the times to have a stake in the times that isn't just oh you can send a tweet or an editor's letter with your feedback yeah. and people understand that analogy um and i think it makes a lot of sense to them the problem with media that already exists is like a lot of these are really big ships to turn, right? Like to take a company like the New York Times or Condé Nast and divert investment into Web3, not knowing what's going to happen or not knowing whether there's going to be a possibility to enter the space authentically. Like you can't just take a Discord and tack it onto GQ and call it a day or tack a Discord onto yeah. Vogue and call it a day, right? So, yeah. you know, we can see how this might be an improvement for these publications, but you can also understand how difficult it would be to just start a DAO. Whereas for us, I feel like we're in a better position because even though we have less brand equity and less prestige and history, this is in the DNA of our publication. So this is a this is sort of one of the first lifestyle publications to actually be born of Web3. Um, and that's a really powerful position to be in. That's amazing. I have so many DAO questions for you, but since in this podcast, we also love to like dive into your own personal stories because Web3 is like, it's so familiar with anonymity, right? Like people have different mm -hmm. names on Discord. You really, you barely know who are the people behind them. So I'd love mm -hmm. to know what is your story, you know, from start to beginning to how you're here now as a person. Well, I've worked in audience development in media for about a decade. Um, I'm also a writer myself. So I was able to see sort of the full arc of the digital media boom, the way that digital ad revenue didn't ever really effectively replace print revenue for most publications. And also the fact that like Facebook and Twitter, some of these algorithmic platforms um, started out as a way for publishers to distribute their content and then ended up just siphoning a lot of value away from these publishers and creators in a way that was pretty damaging. You know, I saw publishers that were sort of chasing after changes in the algorithm, like the pivot to video, hiring more video creators, realizing that those analytics weren't always accurate. And then, you know, people's jobs were on the line in a very real way. So having seen that, having seen behind the scenes and worked at um, media startups like Airmail and First Look Media, but also established media publications like New York Magazine, I think I was really well positioned to see if not the, like, if not full assurance that Web3 could be a better model to at least be curious that it might be. And so for my co-founder, I like we always say, like, we're not trying to save media or save journalism. We're just simply building the media company that we want to see in the world. 
with the best possible tools available to us at this time. And, and these are the tools that we think are the most compelling um, and the most promising for finding a media model that can be more sustainable. And have you you've been born and raised in New York? Oh, I'm from Massachusetts. Yeah, so I was born in Massachusetts, raised in Massachusetts. I went to college in Maine. And then I moved to New York after college. I was in the city in Brooklyn for a long time. And then I moved upstate a bit, not not technically upstate, but north of the city. Yeah. And now I still spend a lot of time in the city. I have a lot of friends that are there. But, you know, that concentration of the media industry in New York is very real. Um, but... Yeah. I think people have also realized through remote work that yes, there's something very energizing and compelling about this skyscraper with 10 magazines, one on each floor. You know, we have a lot of nostalgia for that. We miss it. But for the people that were at the tail end of that, there was a lot of disarray, disorganization, instability, inequality in the labor between people who have worked in magazines for decades and people who are just starting out now and trying to make a living on that salary. So you know, there's a lot of issues in media that I think are not necessarily unique to media, but because media is all about communicating and telling stories and externalizing what's happening in the culture, it's a lot easier for that to be communicated and like come to a head. So I guess like for me, as somebody who's like very curious about technology and was always on the side of building audience engagement and like community, I'm... I'm curious about what the future holds and I wanted to stop living, stop working places where I didn't feel like I had a sense of control. You know, starting a company with emerging tools is a very risky thing, but in a way I feel like I have more control over my life than I did when I was working for yeah. other publications and other people. And that's like a very powerful feeling. I'm super excited for you. I know how Thank um, you. how much of a struggle it can be to be in the space and build a career in business in the space because there's so much ambiguity in the space, right? And there's so much yeah. like negative connotation attached to it also. I'm sure like people told you like, oh my God, crypto is a fad. What are you doing? Why are you leaving, you know, like a oh, well-paid, secure job to start something in this area? What has been your answer to critiques like that? Oh, uh, I think it's, yeah, that's such a good question. Um, well, one analogy that I use a lot and seems to resonate with people is that the blockchain is like architecture and cryptocurrency is like real estate. <laughs> um, and I'm really like, I'm an architect, right? So the underlying ledger of transactions and storage of transactions, that's like urban planning or architecture, right? Like you're creating the structures that people are going to actually live their lives within. Cryptocurrency is a financial layer over that. So even if you believe, okay, real estate's a bubble or cryptocurrency is a bubble, if that bubble bursts, the mechanics, the value of the underlying structures to humanity and to culture and the way people interact with each other doesn't change. And so you can be interested in being an architect on the blockchain without being overly invested or um, you know, putting all your eggs in the basket of the financial speculation that's built over it. And people understand that. Um, I think the problem is in like cryptocurrency and the blockchain are so often conflated. You know, cryptocurrency is the most visible use for the blockchain right now. Um, and so it's difficult for people to parse that. And like, I don't blame them. How has it been um, being in New York? Were you able to attend the NFT NYC or even like DAO NYC mm -hmm. they had recently? Like, were you able to attend it? Yes, I was at NFT NYC and we threw our own party and it was very fun. So exciting. Um, we, yeah, we had like a, we wanted to do something classy. So we had a really nice um, small gathering at a wine bar on the Lower East Side and brought together investors and members of the DAO and readers and um, it was actually a really good mix of people from media and from this Web3 space just mingling and getting to know each other, which is very on brand for us. That's amazing. Yeah. yeah. Well, was it like your first time meeting our readers in real life? Like, how did that interaction go? It would have been so surreal. Yeah. For some people, uh, it was my first time meeting them. Um, first time meeting some investors in person. So, yeah, I guess I do put a lot of um, stock in like virtual relationships. So I feel like that off online offline split is like less weird than it used to be. But yeah, there's really no substitute for meeting somebody in person for the first time and saying like, oh my gosh, you're like taller than I thought you would be. You know what I mean? <laughs> For yeah. sure. That's amazing. You know, we've uh we are a DAO tooling company 
And one mm-hmm. of the first things, four things we're developing is, one is a discovery tool where a lot of like consumers can come and just discover DAOs because a lot of questions are like, you know, how do I even find the right DAO, right? Mm-hmm. The You can Google it, but it takes a lot of time to really get down to like, you know, the correct answers for you. Uh, next is the onboarding tool, which we just integrated to our Discord. And something really interesting we're seeing is we are able to have a very structured community. We have a very clear idea of, you know, who are the people who are in our system versus even they don't feel lost. You know, they get mm-hmm. personalized channels or even they get a personalized experience. They're like, oh, this is something I'm familiar with. And that is something that is helping people understand and become much more user friendly with technologies like Discord or DAOs um, and stuff like that. So how, coming back to the question, like how important do you think onboarding is for your contributors? I think it's super important. You know, for us, the newsletter is its own sort of funnel and onboarding mechanism. But yeah, I think onboarding is probably one of the biggest pain points for people right now and for our audience honestly it's like the biggest moment is downloading the wallet right because we're dealing with people who might have not even bought their first nft yet um so yeah i think the easier and frictionless that could be the better for the space that's awesome um great feedback you know i'd love to for you to like try a product and when you're interested mm-hmm. to give feedback on it because this is a similar problem we're seeing with a lot of admins in the DAO space and collecting their feedbacks and trying to improve on this tool because we really know how empowering this space is, whether it's DAOs for admins or contributors, how people can have so much freedom over their time, work for things they love, and you know, find a sense of their identity, which they might not have been able to do, you know, otherwise in the world. So I think it'll be phenomenal. And I'd love to ask you also, if the meeting ends, please do rejoin. Um, oh yeah, of course. So one of the things I'd love to ask you is, what's your why um, to being in the crypto space? Why not AI? Mm-hmm. Why not some other form of tech? Like, why crypto? Well, I'm not really a technologist. Like, the things that I understand about technology are the point that technology touches culture. Um, and so this space, I was able to understand through a cultural lens and understand that the blockchain had the potential to touch every part of culture. Um, and that's what made it legible to me because like, that's my world. Um, and the people who have self-selected into our project, especially the investors are all people who care a lot about culture at large and in general, and whether that's fashion or music or books. And so those two things, you know, the technology and these cultural products don't exist in a vacuum. Um, and so I sort of, am motivated to be at that intersection to basically kind of bend the space to my cultural values and my priorities rather than leave it to people who are very immersed in the tech space and don't have a very cohesive broad or empathetic view of like culture and politics and society that's amazing and what would you say is your just life philosophy i think this is a question we're asking everyone that if they had say novels twitter for a day and if they could tweet one thing what is it that you'd like to tweet oh my gosh my life <laughs> philosophy <laughs> yeah i i think i just want to leave my corner of the world like in what i care about which is people who are creating content and art um to leave that space better than i found it to like i said not necessarily set out to save the world, but to create an example of how things could be more functional or more fair or equitable. Like equity is like really important to me, not in the the stocks sense, in the sense that like Ownership. the industry, well, no, they just having things be more fair, like the industry up until this point, hmm. who's actually had the luxury to be a writer or a magazine writer and engage in the space has been totally skewed towards people coming with from more resources. Um, and so if there's more tools or structures where people can engage in the space, no matter what their background is, that's very important to me. And especially like creating, even though this subscriber relationship is financialized, like there should be pathways for people who bring value to essentially like inherit a founder pass or a subscription. And like, we've definitely rewarded people who came in to dirt at like a low price point or we're among our first hundred writers like those are people that we want to be a part of it and we don't have want them to necessarily have to like pay to play or anyone to have to pay to play beyond what's fair for the cost of what we're producing that's amazing and what would you what would your advice be for someone who's wanting to learn more about DAOs, you know so that they can eventually leverage them yeah i think just do your research participate like the best way to learn is by doing to be honest so pop into different discords ask questions you know the same way you would investigate like anything you're interested in for sure um i love that 
I think without actually being there, without actually being confused and being lost, you'll never understand what, you know, to do. And until you, and I feel like it's such early days and that is where a lot of leverage lies. So uh, it's so worth it to explore these areas. And on the ending note, is it something that you'd like to ask or even like share on your end? No, I mean, we we don't have anything launching in the next couple of weeks that I could plug. Um, we will be doing a big launch near the end of the year. So yeah, I would love to just get people reading Dirt. Um, if you visit our website, dirt.fyi, it'll allow you to sign up for the newsletter, to join our Discord. Um, to see some of the artwork that we produced in the past, some of our most popular articles. But I think the newsletter is, it's our core product. It's what makes participation compelling. And so if people fall in love with the content there and feel like they're getting something out of it, I'm happy. That's amazing. For sure. Um, Super excited to explore more on what Dirt has coming up. Super excited to see your merchandise. Your bracelet looks really pretty. So oh, thank you. <laughs> super excited for that. And just like on the ending note, thank you so much for doing this. Please, please be in touch and please let us know if there's any way that we can provide value. And um, just excited to see everything that you have going on building. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. Of course. Talk have to you an, soon. Definitely. Have an incredible rest of the day and best of luck for everything. <laughs> thank Bye. you. Bye.